spiritual practice emerges from, uh, I guess, familial stories around dreaming, but then also your personal dreams and your connections to Indonesia, but also to Sydney. I guess I was wondering how your recurring dream that you had in lead up to holding patterns played into the project and formulating the work Harbingers of Doom. I, I had this recurring dream this year where um, these large, very, like very large dogs were um, resting in my lap um, and they would slowly just approach me and, and just lay their heads in my lap and then just gradually sink their teeth into my knee uh, over time and I just let it happen and it was very sad, it was a really sad recurring dream um, and it very much reflected um, what was happening in my life at the time and the mood around me um, and so it felt just like a natural progression to, to utilise that dream when I was already exploring dreams as a concept in, in my work. Um, so this recurring dream, I guess, reflected a sense of melancholy and pessimism that, that, was, that I was perceiving in my working life that, mm. I, yeah, that I wanted to kind of play with in the studio as well. Yeah. Mm. Have, um, I guess, dogs been like a symbol for you in your dreams and kind of like... Not previously, no, previously. no, but yeah. it, it was an interesting symbol to, yeah. to have as a recurring dream and there is so much that is attached to that symbol um, across cultures as well and, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a lot of cultures the black dog is symbolic of depression or of mm -hmm a deep sadness and then in other cultures it, like in, in Islam it can be symbolic of uh, shaitan or which you know is a, a, the devil yeah. Um, so yeah it's a very interesting symbol to have as a recurring dream this year Definitely. in particular yeah. <laughs> and when you look at the I guess the fabric they kind of seem luminous or something as well they don't just seem black but it's kind of this shifting mm. um, iridescent quality as well with Harbingers of Doom, you've included your storm glasses, which you've been quite infatuated with since last year. Mm. I was wondering if you can talk a bit to that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so I came across the storm glass by chance um, and was just enamoured with it. It was it's this antiquated um, weather instrument that is constantly mutating mm. in response to the, the environment and at the time that I came across it I was really interested in um, looking at bodies of water in relation to other bodies of water or watery bodies and so I, I was really drawn to this contained body um, mm. of water that was constantly in relation to and changing in relation to other bodies around it mm. um, and so this object it's no longer used for its accuracy i don't think because <laughs> it's not really that accurate um but it's still this really fascinating object yeah. um that has a really long history and very strange history no one really knows who invented it um but it's said to have been around since about the 1700s mm -hmm. um and was popularised by Admiral Fitzroy, um, who was on the HMS Beagle, who yeah. accompanied Charles Darwin on his great expedition across the world. Um, so he's kind of the, the he was the, um, the first person to kind of popularise it, and he took it upon himself to popularise it among illiterate fishermen, because it doesn't require any tools, like any written mm. measurements or anything like that. So it did offer a lot to the working class in yeah. his community, which was very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like it's very based on instinct as well. Like mm. It kind of talks to that, um, I guess, even like similarly to the compass, it's kind of something that you use intuitively. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I also really just like the idea that it was used as a tool of prediction and that it has that kind of connotation to a crystal ball and and both of those things are a little bit um, dubious, you know, yeah. in their um, scientific yeah. purpose. <laughs> <laughs> and it can also be a real symbol of faith as well, like that it will show some sort of guiding force or, or mm -hmm. some sort of 
significant sign to follow. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. In your work, Self-Fulfilling Prophecies, there's these calligraphic shapes that you've made out of the prints that show dead eel flesh and flies kind of nibbling on them. Mm -hmm. And then you've carved out the, the sentence um, I suspect I shall die disappointed, and it's from the TV show um, The Great. The Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This sentence really stood out to me because it was said in this really endearing way that was kind of both um, accepting mm -hmm. of this fact that I sh suspect I shall die disappointed. It was accepting, but it's also it was also said with a, a sense of defeat, mm -hmm. and that kind of just echoed to me what was happening around me, not just with you know what, what was going on collectively, but very much reflected what was happening in my personal life at the time as well. Um, and so that sentence, in you know, those six words, it's just such a simple sentence, yeah. but it says so much and it just really summed up where I was at. Yeah. Um, and I, for me, it's, it's, a, it's about an unconditional love Mm. Um, but it's also really morbid. It's mm. so morbid and I loved playing with this image of a dead eel and then mutating that into this sentence where it was already, it was already death, you know, mm. it was this kind of tautology where it was like it's already what it says it's going to be. A lot of people that I've encountered during that work have also had the same reading of it as well. Mm. In that one word, die, the the eye in that word is very small it's, it's hardly there and so it does from a distance just look like it says i suspect i should be disappointed and i actually really like that it speaks <laughs> to that slippage in language as well like you sort of say something and it has a different meaning from what you know someone else will interpret or um or you yourself think and then it reads differently hmm. yeah there's a, a lot of different i guess layers to that and um, I guess that also ties into sort of your infatuation with like mutation and, and I kind of was wondering whether you could speak to that and mm -hmm. the use of the eel flesh. <laughs> For me, mutation is something that we're always doing and that's kind of an overriding theme across all of my work, um, both as a, a, a concept that I like to explore, but also in the processes that I use as well. Um, and yeah, the, that work, Self-Fulfilling Prophecies, even though it is this kind of hard and fast statement, it does have that ability to mutate mm. in meaning mm. um, across viewers or yeah, depending how, how much time you spend with it maybe. Um, and for, for me, I just really loved that, um, that image of this dead eel and stretching that and mutating that in mm. Photoshop which just began as an experiment and then and then I thought why not why not just make this into a font That's yeah kind of weird and <laughs> morbid <laughs> yeah also like I mean imagine just yeah I feel like people wouldn't think of carving words out of eel flesh as well it's mm. just kind of something so unexpected yeah it's very yeah. silly and then melodramatic and so <laughs> is the whole work and the whole sentence <laughs>